1995, you had a book that started, well, your journey with everyone. That book has changed a lot of people's lives. But what has it been like for you in 1995? Came out with what? The malignant self-love? I was diagnosed with narcissistic personality disorder twice. And I found myself in a, in a situation where there was no, no literature. There was academic literature, which dated to the beginning of the 20th century, believe it or not. There were some studies conducted in the 70s. But there was no literature, definitely no popular literature. I wanted to understand my disorder. I wanted to pull myself out of the out of the rock bottom situation I found myself in. And so I started to study. And, and then the first thing I discovered is that there was no language. There was simply no language. I was trying to explain, I was trying to describe internal dynamics in myself. Mm -hmm. I was trying to um, commit to paper relationships, what happened in my interpersonal relationships, intimate relationships, workplace relationships, etc. And I couldn't, there was no language, simply. So the first thing I did in, in 1995 was invent a whole new language. So the bulk of the language in use today, for example, narcissistic abuse, right? but not, not only, uh, was actually either, I either invented it, I either coined it, or I borrowed from early psychoanalytic literature, psychoanalytic literature in 1930s up to the 1960s. I borrowed terms and phrases from that literature and I adapted them to the study of Nazism. So today about 90% of the language in use is the language that I uh, came up with in the, in the 90s. It's a direct- I did, the, I did it first and foremost to capture my experience so, initially. So today, much is a derivative of your exploration into understanding or setting a language for what you were going through. Yeah, it started 90, like that. 90%. I'm going to make sure I understand. 90% of what everyone is batting around <laughs> came about because you well, were... The language. The, the language. Well, I mean, the language. The, the overall... Yeah, the language, yeah. The language is easily 90%, if not more. I mean, flying monkeys, hoovering... Uh, somatic narcissists, cerebral narcissists, inverted narcissists, um, narcissistic supply, false self, devalue and discard, narcissistic abuse. These are all my creations or adaptations of early, early psychoanalytic analytic literature. In 1995, you're a professional at that time, yes? Right? You're a professional? I was, a, I was actually a businessman. Oh, oh you're a businessman. Okay. Okay. All right, you're a businessman. Now, do you... Did and you, a physicist. Oh, and a physicist. And a physicist, right. Right. That's right. I'm trying to wrap my brain around this much. Before that time frame, there was no one that could help you with the language. Were you seeing a therapist or anything like that at that time? Nobody could. So I was diagnosed by two therapists, but you must you must realize that the first time narcissistic personality disorder yeah. had appear, had appeared in any meaningful text yeah. was 19, 1980. That's not a long time ago. No, that is not. Okay, no. you're, blowing, you're blowing my mind, Sam. Night, okay, that's so, not that's, long that's ago. Not long ago. So when the first time I'd been diagnosed with narcissistic personality disorder was 1985. That was five years after NPD made it into the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual. Got it. Got no it. one knew anything about NPD. Nothing. There was nothing. There was no literature, no scholarship, no nothing. It was virgin land, terra incognita. And when I when I attempted to describe to people what's going on inside me, right, and what it is that I'm doing to my so-called nearest and dearest, my insignificant others, my non-intimate partners, you know, right. I was trying to to convey this when I was trying to communicate. I had to resort to to phrases half a page long, and then I said, "The heck with it! I mean, I must come up with a language," you know. Right. And so I did. I did come up with a language. Of course, a lot of time had passed since then. Um, the field had evolved beyond recognition. There are many dozens of new contributors and hundreds maybe of new contributors and so on. But I think I think my initial work was pioneering and, and I think it had transformed it had transformed society in, in several ways. For example, today the concept of narcissism is an organizing principle. Today when you try to explain someone's behavior, 
I get you. Polit politics. Yes. Yeah. Corporate misbehavior. Yeah. Uh, the law, law enforcement, mm -hmm. um, victimhood movements, or um, you know, when today narcissism serves as the principle of organization of social and individual interactions. I see it in movies. I can't go. I can't watch any movie. I can't watch any documentary without coming across the word narcissism in the first five minutes. Narcissism, narcissist, this, that. So today, narcissism is, is a buzzword and a keyword. It is by far the, the hot button topic in psychology. Yes, yes. If that's the case, does it seem like the very concept of what it, what it stood for when you started has been watered down, diluted, or confused? Yes, narcissism, of course, pathological narcissism is a clinical entity. In other words, it's a diagnosis in clinical psychology, abnormal psychology. Mm -hmm. And now it's been exactly as you say, it's been diluted or watered down and it become a pejorative. It became, became a, a curse word. There you it go. It became yeah. a way to demean and devalue other people you don't like. Label institutions, institutions right. you don't like. You know. Politicians, whatever it may be. Uh, yeah. It could be, it could be any structure. You can label it that way and yeah. uh, people could run with it in many directions. But when it came to your life, it began to give you an opportunity to explain what you were putting others through. Would you say, how'd you say, insignificant others? Is that what you said? Yeah, that's what it, I said. The Absolutely. insignificant others. What were you doing to others? If you had a way to describe it succinctly, shrink wrap, I, I, how would you describe back then the Sam of 1995, 80, 85 to, to 95 before you... Not, nothing, nothing has changed. It's a common myth. It's a common myth that insight and learning and knowledge changes cause, tra cause transformation. It's no. not true. Okay. I know everything there is to know about narcissism I wish to believe. And yet nothing has changed in me. I'm exactly the same as I, as I had always been. And what I do to other people, especially intimate partners, but not only business partners, Okay. What I do to other people is that I objectify them. I take away their vitality. I reduce them. I reduce them to a function, an instrument, a tool, a device. I make them lose the ability to conceive of themselves as separate entities with rights, wishes, preferences, priorities, and so on. I assimilate and digest them. I body snatch and mind snatch. Do, do you find... And I take over from the inside. Okay, so do you find yourself affecting other individuals' thought patterns, desires, motivation? And if so, do you affect other people's thought patterns? Because when you walk into a room or when you begin to just talk with them, Everything I say apply to, applies to all narcissists, especially to psychopathic narcissists, but I zombify them. I take away their vitality, as I just say, said. Okay. I, I render them zombies. They go through the motions, they say the right things, but there's no sparkle in their eyes. There's no spark in their eyes anymore. There's it's no zapped. blood flow. It's zapped. It's zapped. It's not in their eyes anymore. So uh, then I ask you this. Um, sure. I'll throw a word at you and you tell me what you think. The word affection. How do you view the word affection and any, any connotations or thoughts that come with that from your perspective? I'm incapable of experiencing positive emotions because in, in my okay. world, okay. positive emotions are intimately linked with negative emotions and negative emotions are life-threatening or dysregulated. Uh, got it. Got so it. if I allow myself to experience anything positive, the gates, the gates of trauma will open, will, will open wide. For you. And I'll drown. I'll drown. I'll dysregulate. The gates of, the gates of trauma for you will open up. So yes. therefore you have to navigate and pivot away from those. Or I do have to repress. I have to repress okay. my positive emotions because if I allow myself to emote, I, I, will have, I will have opened the gates of my early childhood trauma. Okay. And I will drown. Okay. I'll become dysregulated. Technically, I'll become borderline. And Technically. You, okay. And and when you when you when a person say you when a person let's say it's me let's say I'm doing that if I start to move toward being borderline what does that mean for those because a lot of beginners 
down this journey or dealing with narcissism, listen and watch Narc Abuse TV Network. If I start moving toward borderline, what does that mean? What does that mean for me and the people around me? There was a scholar by the name of uh, Rothschild. He said that uh, Rothschild, he said that uh, borderline personality disorder is a failed attempt to become a narcissist. It's when you fail to become a narcissist as a child that you end up being borderline. Okay. Now, what happens with a narcissist is reverse engineering. When you expose a narcissist to stress, especially a challenge to the narcissist's grandiosity, mm -hmm. humiliation, especially public humiliation, the narcissist goes through a process called narcissistic injury or narcissistic wounding. Another much, much more profound process is called narcissistic mortification. In these two processes, the defenses of the narcissist crumble, disappear. And consequently, the narcissist is exposed to an, a tsunami of negative emotionality, including shame, guilt, fear, etc. At that point, he becomes technically a borderline. So narcissistic rage, narcissistic rage is a borderline state of narcissism. At that point, he becomes a borderline in the sense that he can no longer control his emotions. They become dysregulated. They take over. He's overwhelmed. He drowns in them. And he flails around and, and he lashes out. And he, so he becomes very injurious to other people, dangerous to other people. Now, in some cases, um, a psychopathic state emerges. Right. So the, the transition is from narcissism to borderline, and then to psychopathy. Now, that's not a steady pattern that will happen all the time then, but it can lead to a psychopathic aspect from the borderline. A derivative of it will, they can move into that area. Or no, let me rephrase that. I'm going to go back to me. I could go from being borderline and then move to that psychopathic state. All borderlines, all people in a borderline state, let alone with borderline personality disorder, all of them have a psychopathic self-state. Ah, okay. So it's a protective state. It's a savior state. It's a rescuer state. The psychopathic it, state? Yes, the psychopathic state helps to defend and protect the borderline from, from abandonment, from humiliation, from rejection, from fear, from shame, from guilt. So when the borderline experiences stress, when she feels that she's about to be abandoned, abandonment anxiety, Right, right. When she can no longer regulate her emotions, mm -hmm. suddenly she becomes a secondary psychopath. A secondary psychopath is a psychopath with emotions and empathy. So she becomes a secondary psychopath and she begins to behave like a psychopath would. It's the same with the narcissist. When the narcissist is challenged, his grandiosity is challenged and undermined, when mm -hmm. he's devalued, when he's humiliated, exposed, when he, whatever when he's exposed, right. Right. He then he then transitions to borderline. And then the borderline experiences dysregulated emotions and the narcissist becomes a psychopath, a, sec a, a temporary secondary, psychopath. Secondary psycho psychopath. When they get into yeah. that, excuse me, I'm back to me. So I get into a secondary psychopath state. When I say narcissist, get excuse me, just correct. As a narcissist, yeah. you're incapable of empathy and emotions. So you will transition to a primary psychopath, not secondary. Uh, okay, got it. And now okay. once, once I'm in that state, hmm. Everybody in my uh, in my sphere, everyone in my anybody that I come across, I'm gonna super duper lash out. As a psychopath, in the psychopathic self state, yeah, you are you are defiant, you are contumacious, you hate authority, uh, you are you are reckless, yeah. you are impulsive, you are aggressive in the in the psychopathic self state. Huge, huge emotional pushback and and defiance will will come to the fore. Is kind of what you're saying. If defiance, I defiance aggression, correct me, correct me if I understand you. Yes, it defiance aggression, um, hatred of authority and rules, uh, impulse, impulsivity, recklessness. You will do crazy things that will endanger people around you. You know. Right, right, right. And now, is is it possible that I would de-escalate or come down from that? You do always. This is well, a temporary self state. It's okay. a temporary self state. Having re-established your grandiosity as a narcissist, because when you become a psychopath. You terrify everyone around you. You set everything so that, back in order, as it were. You, yes, you you feel godlike. Yeah, you, create, you feel godlike yeah. because everyone is terrified of you. Yeah, and oh, so yeah. your gra your grandiosity is restored. And once your grandiosity is restored, you don't need to be a psychopath anymore. 
You can go back to being a narcissist. If this becomes a pattern that a person can, if, if this is a pattern that I have from childhood and I've perfected it, I can set the world or the universe in my own mind. I'm just saying this. You're the expert. Again, <laughs> an audience of one. You're enduring my, my weirdness here. Okay, so then I can pretty much set the world uh, back in order if I don't think uh, everything's going my way and I'm about to get exposed to childhood trauma and emotions or whatever it may be. <clears throat> All I have to do is when I get to that psychopathic a primary stage, if I'm understanding you correctly. Primary, primary psychopathic. So right? Okay. I can pretty much set the world back in order and I could be godlike and put everything back and now everything's okay because I've, I've made sure everybody's afraid of me. Yes. What I, or what I could do to them. Leave them, abandon them, take their affect their finances. You feel omnipotent. You feel omnipotent. Yeah, you feel you all go. powerful, Perfect. all powerful, and then then you don't need to be a psychopath because your grandiosity oh, no, has been restored. Right. You're a narcissist. Yeah. yeah, I can I can go back down to being a narcissist, as it were. Right. This pattern of existence is not just one or two people on the planet. Have you recognized that it's an ongoing pattern that's growing? Well, we should distinguish very carefully. And this distinction is lost on many self-styled experts and so on. We should distinguish between narcissistic personality disorder, okay. mal malignant narcissism, which is a confluence of psychopathy and narcissism, mm -hmm. and narcissistic style. Now, the concept of narcissistic style was first described by Lynn Sperry. Lynn, Lynn Sperry is a scholar. Theodore Millen, another guy. I'm taking notes. Okay, so just... Lynn Sperry and Theodore Millen described the narcissistic style. Narcissistic style is simply someone who is an a-hole, you know, just an a-hole. He tramples on everyone, he's insensitive, he cracks the wrong jokes at the wrong time, he's right, right, exploitative, right. exploitative he's, a, he's a bit abusive, and so on and so forth. But he doesn't amount to a full-fledged narcissist. It is estimated that up to 15%, 1-5% of the population have narcissistic style. The figure is much higher among the young, among people under the age of 25. Really? Yes. So, so uh, just real quick before you keep going, the narcissistic style, we're not talking to somebody that's going to give a major pushback. They're just being a major jerk. Yes. Okay. All right. Go ahead. Yes. You were saying. Jerks. That's a word. Jerks. Okay. And this is much more common among the young than among the older generations. There are studies by J John Twench and Keith Campbell and many others that have demonstrated that this kind of narcissism, narcissistic style, had exploded among the young and is five times higher than 40 years ago. So it seems to be the style, the personality style, the dominant personality style of young people, possibly because of the influence of social media. Social media, know. I was going to say that, yeah, yeah, yeah. Possibly, possibly. Yeah. Well, it could, we, it don't could, know, we don't know which is the chicken, which is the egg. Well, yeah, but one thing is for sure, you, you're going to get you're going to get chicken in one way or the other, either scrambled yeah. or you're going to get it cooked, one or the other. So, so... Either way, social media could be feeding that, uh, but that's, that's something, uh, that's a whole nother show. But, but so when it's a narcissistic style, and then you have narcissistic the personality one? disorder. Okay. Narcissistic in personality disorder is diagnosed in about 1% of the population. 1%, okay. And there are nine diagnostic criteria, and there is an alternative model of narcissistic personality disorder in the fifth edition of the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual. Okay. It's a severe, a very severe mental health disorder. Um, Kernberg, Otto Kernberg, who was one of the leading scholars of the in, the in the field, thought that narcissism is a form of psychosis, psychotic oh. disorder. Mm -hmm. So it's a really, really a very bad affliction. And then you have the combination of this with psychopathy. Okay, and before that, you, that is not that is malignant narcissism. With with all due respect, please bear with me. Uh, yeah. When you, because I'm writing this down, when you get to this aspect of the NPD, before we get to the one you just mentioned, mm -hmm. the NPD, now the first one we said, you know, we're talking about a major jerk. How would you, in a few words, describe this for those who are just trying to understand and who will watch this later? How would Everything you is more extreme. In the narcissistic style, there's a deficit in empathy. In NPD, there's no empathy. The narcissistic style would try to leverage people, to use people, to obtain goals. Got it. The narcissist would trample and destroy people in the pursuit uh, of goals. Got it. Everything is simply more extreme. Got it. Um, so, the, for example, the narcissistic style would be mildly, mildly envious of other people's accomplishments and so on. 
the narcissist would try to destroy uh, people he envies. So we're talking envy, we're talking, envy is a dominant feature. We're, we're talking about somebody that, that does some major demolition to somebody's yes. life. They're, they're not yes. coming in and just kicking a few things around and throwing a table. They're not benign. They're, they're not, not benign. They're not benign. They're not, no, not benign. by any means, they're not benign. They're coming no. in uh, driven by envy or, or, or something like that and uh, fueled with anger and other things. And they're trying to make sure you don't exist. Entitlement. Uh, entitlement. entitled. Oh, that's a good one. Okay. For example, people with narcissistic style are not entitled. People with NPD are entitled. Entitlement really? simply, means that, simply means that you think you deserve some things, special treatment to talk to the top people, whatever, without any commensurate achievements, without any investment, without any effort, without any... So you believe you deserve to be uh, uh, to have a PhD without having invested a minute in studies. Yeah? Right. And everything that comes with the PhD. You want, you want the PhD. Right. And you, you want the money, you want the prestige, the, you want the you want lifestyle, everything. With everything and yeah, not, but you don't not want to invest in, in your studies. No, no work for it. Yeah. Right, right, right. Well, yeah, well, so this is entitlement. That's entitlement. Now, now that's, NPD, not, that's not, that's not uh, apparent or a part of a narcissistic style, though, correct? No. Okay, got it. I'm sorry. Go so ahead. You were going to say. So, so these, these narcissists, this 1% of the population, and today there is a trend in academia, in universities, where I teach. I teach, I, I teach yes. psychology in several universities. Mm -hmm. Colleagues of mine in, in other universities, they try to espouse the view that narcissism and psychopathy are positive evolutionary adaptations that it's good to be a narcissist, that we need narcissists in positions of power and authority, like chief executive officers, presidents okay. of the United States. All I can do is I, take my I head. strongly oppose this ignorant view. This is enormous ignorance. This is not knowing the first thing about narcissism. I, I'm, I'm surprised by that. Yeah. Kevin, Kevin Dutton, Macobi, I can give you many names. High-functioning high functioning narcissists, it's called. So... Wow. Productive, productive narcissists and high-functioning narcissists and productive I psychopaths. I don't even know what to say to that. There are whole, there's, a whole, there, there's a whole library of books saying that psychopaths are the best thing that has ever happened to humanity because they can make tough decisions. They, they, you know, they're great military leaders and surgeons. Wow. I mean, it's a great thing we have psychopaths. We should encourage them and egg them on. And breathe them, as it were. Yeah, in a way. So... I don't think these people know what the heck they're talking about, honestly. Because, for example, narcissists, they start off very convincingly and very charmingly. They, they co-opt everyone around them. They create cults, personality cults, and so on. But they end up badly. Everything around them goes up in flames. Adolf Hitler, Donald Trump, everything goes up in flames at the end. There's no such thing as a productive, high-functioning narcissist. It's nonsensical myth, you know, and not not backed by the by most of the literature, most. So that's a problem. Now, malignant narcissists are really, really by far the most dangerous. They are even more dangerous than psychopaths, because oh, wait, are this, works, is this a know. part of the psychopathy part that you're talking about? The malignant are they in there? Is this the whole different? malignant narcissists are are confluence combination psychopath and narcissist in the uh, same person? Got it. Okay. They are by far the most dangerous breed. And you are talking to one right now. They're the most dangerous breed. Why is that? Because a, a proper psychopath, what we call factor one psychopath, mm -hmm. a proper psychopath, he is goal-oriented. He wants money. He wants sex. He wants power. He gets what he wants. He doesn't bother with you. He's not, he's not going to harm you. So he's very goal-oriented. Yeah, he's ruthless. He's callous. He has no scruples. He is impulsive, he's defiant, he is aggressive, it's all true. But at least he's human. The psychopath is human because you want sex also, don't you? You want money, you want power. It's a human aspiration. It's just that on the way to his goal, he would be less he's scrupulous than you, less moral than you. He's chopping down trees uh, through the forest yeah. uh, to get to where he wants to go instead of yeah. just walking through the forest and enjoying the trees. He's looking at him going like, you know what? That tree don't need to be there. It's in my way. But you're both, but you're both headed to the same destination. Driven by the same, uh, uh, as it in were, natural human impulse or desire. Urges. Except, or desires. except, yeah, except uh, not, a so, not so the malignant narcissist. The malignant narcissist. Not so the narcissist when it, when it is combined with psychopath. Because uh, when the narcissist is combined with psychopath, 
that this, this type is not driven by goals, is driven by impulses, dysregulated emotions, envy, hatred, lack of empathy. So it's like this kind of narcissist has all the tools of the psychopath, lack of morality, lack, lack of, of morality. Yeah, right, right. And leverages the psychopath to accomplish narcissistic uh, gratification. Goals, goals and gratification, right. Mm-hmm.